So as, as we've seen, we have amazing work that's being done here in Arizona. We also have um, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America here in Arizona and some breakthrough work that's being done as we combine two different therapies for the betterment of cancer patients. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Glenn Weiss. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, thank you uh, to AZ Bio and Joan for inviting me here today to represent uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America and give you uh, some insight into the types of studies that we're doing. Let me see if I can figure this out. Nope. Okay, here are my disclosures. And I want to leave you all with some key takeaway points. Um, for those of you that don't see or treat patients with uh, cancer, I want you to understand that there are differences between other types of omics assays. There are a number of types of omic assays that are available. How these assays are being used in the clinic, that there is the emergence of immunotherapy and its potential implications for the clinic and treating patients with advanced cancer, and future directions for clinical trials. So some of you may know, this is a schema of how we approach typically patients with cancer. There are a variety of pathways that may be involved, and typically our most effective therapies target one pathway. And when we're using genomic sequencing, we can identify one or two pathways, but we're limited on what we can do, how many drugs we can combine, and mostly that's because of uh, potential toxicity as well as um, financial cost. So at the uh, national cancer meeting a few years ago, the president of the organization at that time gave a very simplistic explanation of how to identify cancer and how to categorize it, and I think that this is uh, apropos. So stupid cancers are cancers that have a single dominant driver mutation, and they have a small mutational load. When targeting those cancers, we're usually able to um, get effective results, and resistance in these stupid cancers are very rare, and when they do occur, this resistance occurs late. In contrast, smart cancers, such as pancreas cancer, certain types of lung cancer, breast cancer, the more common types that we see that are difficult to treat, especially when they're stage four, have multiple simultaneous drivers, and they carry a number of mutations, and they require targeting multiple drivers. That the resistance to treatment is also common and usually occurs early in the treatment course. So the likelihood of therapy using precision medicine, identifying a mutation or driver, we're more likely to have success when we have one dominant driver, when this is a driver is associated with an inferior outcome, when the agents that target that driver uh, can be given without significant toxicity to the patient, and when we have an, an agent that we're using where we know the mechanism of action. We're likely to see failure with our treatments when the target that we're using to hit uh, drugs with, or the drugs that we're using to hit patients' cancers with, uh, that target is not necessarily abnormal in, uh, in, in the cancer, or, it's, uh, or it may be present in a variety of um, organs. That agent that we're using doesn't have a high specificity for the target. The agent may deliver broad toxicity across multiple systems, uh, cardiac, neuro neurotoxicity affecting the bone marrow, et cetera. The agent that we're using doesn't have a well-known mechanism of uh, we don't understand the mechanism of action of that agent, and we don't have a good way of selecting patients that are most likely to benefit from that agent. So as you've uh, heard in, in Obama's uh, presidential address, we're talking about precision medicine, that this is the, the latest thing in oncology, as well as other diseases, trying to identify that patient and match that patient with a precise treatment. And this is the, the concept of individualized therapy. We're trying to find the therapy that delivers benefit when we're looking at patients with the same, with the same cancer type, same stage, same um, uh, comorbidities. We're trying to identify the treatment that's gonna deliver benefit with as little toxicity as possible rather than the other outcomes where we may be delivering toxicity and or no benefit at all. So one of the first examples of application of precision medicine in advanced cancer was the drug trastuzumab, which is an antibody targeting the HER2 protein. 
The HER2 protein is abnormal in about 15 or 20 percent of breast cancers. And uh, the original trial was designed to specifically look for patients with breast cancer who had high levels or amplification of the HER2 protein, and then treat those patients with trastuzumab or with the standard of care at the time. And if that study was done using an unselected situation where all patients with breast cancer were enrolled, to get the same outcome, the same results, instead of 470 patients, the, the study would have taken nearly 24,000 patients to um, have the same type of outcome. Sorry, I'm getting confused with these. Some other considerations when we're doing clinical trials is trying to identify that biomarker. So for the example I just showed you with trastuzumab, we knew what the biomarker might be that would have or yield the highest probability of success, which was HER2. In other uh, particular drugs that are targeted, we don't always have the best predictor for outcome, the best predictor for uh, those individuals that may benefit. And so there are thousands of papers on biomarkers, and most of those don't pan out when we bring them to the clinic and use them in uh, trials and then uh, beyond that when drugs are approved. So here's a list of basically most of the uh, proven molecular markers for which we have drugs targeting patients with different types of cancers, and some of these are specifically for patients with advanced cancer. For breast cancer, we have estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, and we have anti-estrogens for that, and we use protein biomarkers and stained tissue for that. For, uh, as I mentioned, HER2, that's something that can be done with both uh, protein staining as well as another diagnostic test called FISH, which looks at amplification of DNA. Uh, there is a new test looking at um, whether or not patients with breast cancer may benefit from chemotherapy after they have surgery, and this is looking at RNA in the tumor tissue. Some other molecular tests for colon cancer, we have sequencing of a specific gene, KRAS. When a patient has that mutation in the KRAS gene, they do not benefit from drugs that target the EGFR protein, and so we don't give those types of treatments to those patients with colon cancer. And for lung cancer, for example, we have, again, EGFR gene may be important, and we have drugs that target that, and for patients that have a mutation in the EGFR gene, we give them a drug. Uh, and that's looking at the DNA. And also, more recently, we have another type of translocation in lung cancer that occurs in about 5% of patients, which we use that FISH test for to give patients an ALK inhibitor. So this was the typical history of patients that enrolled on phase one trials. I understand that phase one was already mentioned at this conference. Phase one, the primary purpose is to identify the optimal dose to bring a drug forward and to understand toxicity about these drugs. And nowadays, in, in the more recent time, we're also looking for potential signs of clinical benefit, and sometimes we can pre-select those patients using our current technologies, whether it be uh, protein staining, molecular genetics with uh, looking at genes or RNA, et cetera. So back in this, uh, in this publication that came out in 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine, around 460 phase one trials were conducted in patients with advanced cancer, nearly 12,000 participants, and the degree of response, which was measured by a certain percentage of shrinkage, was seen in only 4% of individuals, and about 30% of individuals had stabilization of their cancer for a period of time. Jumping forward to 2012, uh, a study that was done at one institution looked at roughly uh, 1,140 patients, and using some of our more uh, current genomic testing, looking at gene mutations, et cetera, and then uh, enrolling those patients based on the particular driver, and while this is simplistic, looking at one driver and matching that to one drug, the response rate was a lot higher, somewhere around 27%, and then about a quarter of those patients had stabilization of their disease for more than six months. But response alone does not always translate into improved survival, and I heard another speaker mention that uh, in advanced cancer we haven't made a whole lot of headway in improving survival, but I'll show you some slides in the future, that, uh, in the future of this presentation that will demonstrate that we're probably at a precipice where we may be changing that type of outcome. So you've all heard about whole genome sequencing, I hope. This is a, a technology that's very exciting, and um, it has uh, potential for a lot of um, diseases. In cancer, when we're talking about whole genome sequencing, we're looking at the, uh, the patient's tumor and also at their normal cells, usually collected from a cheek swab or from blood. And we're taking all the DNA, extracting that from both of those samples, the tumor and the normal uh, DNA out of, their, out of their white cells, and then we put it on a machine and this machine fragments the DNA into multiple bits, 
and then it gets read through the machine and then reassembled. The equivalent of the amount of data that's put onto that sequencer is roughly a university law library, taking all the books and volumes in that law library, shredding them up into uh, the individual pages and sentences into bits of about 100 to 150 um, characters, and then reassembling that back together. So you can imagine that there is a lot of potential for error. This requires a lot of computational power, and it takes time. Uh, nowadays, well, in the beginning, when the first uh, genome was sequenced, that took several years and several billion dollars. Now, when we're talking about actual costs, not what it costs just in reagents, the reagents cost around $1,000 to $2,000. The cost, when you're t factoring in time and other uh, elements, probably $30 to $40,000 for a patient's tumor and their DNA, the normal DNA, to be sequenced. And then using that information, we try and put that together to identify those drivers. So here is some of the complexity that we see with this precision medicine focus and trying to identify patients based on their molecular characteristics. This is uh, from a study uh, that was done at TGen looking at patients with all the same type of breast cancer. They had triple negative breast cancer, which means their tumors did not have the presence of estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 positivity, and they were all with stage four metastatic disease. All these uh, women underwent a biopsy, and then they had their normal DNA and their tumor DNA sequenced. And this, these results are depicted in what's called a circus plot, which is uh, all the chromosomes um, aligned down in the circle. And then you have the XX or XY, if this is a male, um, put together. And then each individual blip in these circles indicates either a deletion or a mutation. And then all these lines that traverse across the circle are really gene rearrangements or translocations. So that's a piece of DNA, if it was on chromosome 2, that broke and then connected to chromosome 19. So you'd see something like this. This is where chromosome 2 might lie, and probably 19 is out here somewhere. Um, now you can see from just these six individuals, each one of them, just by looking at the translocations, they're all different. So when we're talking about precision medicine, we have a, a higher degree of complexity. Um, all these patients had, uh, were triple negative, and treating with chemotherapy, we may actually see different outcomes. If we're talking about trying to target something, we have possibly somewhere between a dozen to 50 or so targets, and trying to sort that out with limited amount of data that we have about all these mutations and translocations is very difficult. So where we're focused on at uh, our hospital here in Arizona for, at uh, Western Regional Medical Center, CTCA, is we're not focused just on genomics. There is a whole degree of other complications and issues that can occur in patients' tumors beyond just looking at the DNA level. So if we look at a, whoops, how do I go back? Can you go back one slide? Oh, sorry, I, I figured it out, okay. Um, if you look at a cancer cell here, and we're talking about DNA at the high level, there's also DNA is then uh, transcribed into mRNA or messenger RNA. So looking at all the complications of message, we can sequence the transcriptome. Then message eventually turns into protein for, more, uh, for the most part. And there can be differences in protein expression, which is more critical, because this is what our drugs typically target. They don't just target a mutation. They target the outcome or the protein. And then there are also other things that are um, potentially impactful for determining our treatment. Uh, the metabolome, or different metabolites, sugars, uh, other nucleic acids. And then we have, have, as well, the tumor microenvironment and how uh, different uh, microbiota or microorganisms that exist in our gut, our lung, and other tissues may interact with how the cancer cells grow. They, and there have been some preclinical studies that show that some of, based on the um, composition of the microbiome, we may have drugs that are ineffective as a result of the microbiome composition and not necessarily related to the um, molecular uh, composition of the tumor. So these are other factors that are um, in play that make treating patients based on all this genomics very difficult. And to uh, take a little bit aside here, when we're talking about drug development, and that's what I specialize in, we have multiple um, inputs that go into determining how we bring these drugs to the clinic. So there are usually, these screens are done either universities or pharmaceutical companies. They pick a target of interest. They then uh, take chemical structures that are coming either from nature or synthesized in the lab. These are then optimized for um, characteristics that may make these drugs more appropriate for either um, uh, intravenous administration or oral administration. 
then these drugs are then tested in animal model systems to understand better the toxicology and how the metabolism of these medications may work before they are then brought into human studies. And uh, from the human studies, we then go on from phase one, two, three, et cetera. The timeline when we make it from discovery to the first trial in man, which uh, is when uh, investigational new drug application or IND is submitted to the FDA, that takes about seven years in general. And then usually to go from phase one to approval in cancer takes around seven years. So we're talking about drugs in the clinic maybe five to seven years in the future when we're in phase one before patients uh, in the general population get access to this. And overall in our cancer trials, we have about a 15% success rate when a drug is even able to get to phase three uh, and then ultimately get approved. So um, a well-known oncologist of Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. Leonard Saltz, uh, gave a quote in a cancer uh, newsletter just uh, recently, earlier this year, and he said, the biggest flaw of precision medicine is that the benefits thus far tend to be very short-lived before other mutations emerge and disease control is lost. Cure is virtually unheard of, and this echoes what another speaker was talking about with stage four disease. Median disease control is usually measured in months and rarely approaches anything close to a year. As such, patients are too frequently experiencing and is that all there is phenomenon, and when, we get, and when they get precision medicine, all too soon they are looking into the abyss again. And uh, for the most part, I agree with this statement about precision medicine. Um, as I showed you in one of the earlier slides, there are smart cancers and then there are stupid cancers. And we've had some really good successes with the stupid cancers, but in general for the cancers that are killing a majority of patients or individuals in the US and across the world, uh, these, these tumor types are the smart cancers and they're not easily treatable or you're gonna have a very short duration of disease control when we're talking about multiple gene mutation drivers and other factors including the tumor microenvironment. So one approach that may be a little bit more promising than some of our targeted therapies is immunotherapy. And if uh, some of you have been reading uh, Forbes or Newsweek, in the last uh, couple weeks, uh, there was a big cancer meeting last weekend, and uh, it was all about immunotherapy and how that's changing the course of treatment for patients with cancer. The difference between immunotherapy and targeted therapy is, in general, targeted therapy is delivered with oral medication, and this medication is taken until the patient either has disease progression or toxicity, and they come off. Uh, with immunotherapy, some of these drugs are actually delivered, and there's a defined course. And when we're talking about a defined course, we usually stop if they're able to achieve complete disappearance of their cancer. While that's not you know, for the majority of patients, we're still learning how to better identify those patients that will get benefit from immunotherapy, and I'll show you some graphs and slides of that potential promise. Uh, now, a little bit about immunotherapy and how it works. So your cancer cells are essentially derived from your own body. These are cells that have uh, taken on mutations and divide and basically get out of control. And uh, they appear to be foreign to the immune system. Now you have the immune system that you've had since, you've, uh, since you were born, and these immune cells that we have have uh, the ability to recognize things that are foreign and then kill cancer cells. However, the cancer cells have uh, adapted and learned a way to evade the immune system. And one example of the way that the cancer cells evade the immune system is they express a protein called PDL1. And when PDL1 is expressed, that basically cloaks the cancer and prevents the cancer from identifying. Uh, sorry, the immune, it, um, it cloaks the cancer and prevents the immune system from identifying the cancer as a foreign object. Uh, what we would want to see is if we're able to find an effective immune therapy, we can uh, take off the breaks, identify, help the immune system identify the cancer as foreign, and then that's where we get a, a robust immune response, and then the cancer can be uh, treated possibly uh, for cure. So here are some examples of some historical data for patients with melanoma, and these are survival curves, so this is duration in months and percent survival, and you can see there's a steep drop-off in patients with melanoma. Uh, this paper was published in 1999, and it was using uh, one of the earlier types of immune therapy, and this is FDA approved for melanoma, it's IL-2. 
The problem with IL-2 or interleukin-2 is that it can be very toxic and, and very fit patients have to, um, you know, we have to screen patients, they have to be pretty fit because there are um, significant side effects from this medication. But you can see that around three years, the survival curve starts leveling off and people are surviving out 10 years. So these are individuals with stage four melanoma that are potentially cured. I would say that they're likely cured if they've made it five years out or more. There's still always a possibility of some relapse, but uh, for the most part, this is a fairly stable survival curve. More recently, um, this paper uh, published just this year is a drug called ipilimumab. This is one of the new targeted immunotherapies that's an antibody given by vein, um, and it is given uh, every 21 days for four total courses, and that's it. And Looking at the survival, it's very similar, the percentage of people that have long duration of survival, but um, uh, at, for the most part, these patients are living maybe possibly a little bit longer, and then it's, it uh, tapers out. Again, we have 10-year survivors. Uh, the data doesn't go any further than that because ipilimumab went into the clinic and clinical trials just 10 years ago. Now fast forward to uh, this year's meeting at uh, one of our major cancer conferences. We have new drugs, drugs that target PD-1 and PDL one and this is an example of uh, one of the drugs that targets PD-1, nuvolumab. You see much higher um, percentage of survivals, around 70%, at the same time point that I'm showing here for ipilimumab, which showed about a 30% survival. So likely these patients that are getting nuvolumab are going to do better overall than ipi, but time will tell if that's true. And then beyond melanoma, so that's one of the more uh, common tumor types to respond to immunotherapy, but beyond melanoma, we're now seeing long durable responses in other cancers. So another cancer that sometimes responds to IL-2 is uh, renal cell cancer or kidney cancer. And compared to other standards of uh, targeted therapy, nivolumab has a much higher, um, this is not showing up very well, but nivolumab has a much higher median survival around uh, 18 to 25 months versus just over a year for the targeted therapies that we're using precision medicine. And um, even more exciting is that these immunotherapies are actually showing some results as single agents in advanced cancers that are more, even more common, like lung cancer, cancer that affects both smokers and, and people that never smoked. And so these are some of the survival curves for nivolumab in non-small cell lung cancer. We have individuals surviving out two years. And uh, this is a swimmer plot showing the duration of response. All these arrows here at the end of these lines show that the patients are still on treatment and continuing, many of them now beyond a year. And uh, more recently uh, published just uh, online two weeks ago in New England Journal of Medicine, this is uh, another PD-1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab in non-small cell lung cancer given as either first-line treatment for stage four or beyond first-line treatment. And the results here are stratified based on expression of uh, PD-L1 in the tumor. But the bar that I'm showing here is 12 months. And in general, for first-line therapy, median survival is around 12 months for patients with advanced stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And this is performing better. The median uh, here has not been reached and patients are out more than uh, 16 months at this point. Um, it's better than targeted therapy where we're looking at drugs that target EGFR and ALK. So uh, a lot of people in thoracic oncology are very excited about these drugs coming to the clinic very soon, and here's another example. Um, and this drug has this, this other PDL one, um, which doesn't have an official generic name yet, it's just letters and numbers, has shown efficacy also in bladder cancer, and there's uh, PD1s being used right now in breast cancer and clinical trials uh, that are showing high degrees of response. Again, this is the response rate uh, across PD1 and PDL1 inhibitors in, in lung cancer, somewhere around 15 to 24%. One of the uh, unique issues with immunotherapy is sometimes when we do scans like we're doing typically for target therapy or standard of care treatment, we see what's called a, a flare phenomenon or pseudoprogression. And so these tumors, because they're infiltrated by the immune system response, they actually get larger or look larger, and this can be deceiving that a patient is actually progressing when in fact they're not. So in this uh, pre-treatment scan, you see the tumor here. At two months, it's much larger. And normally, if this patient were in a clinical trial, we would stop their treatment because it looks like the drug's not effective. But then fast forward to four months, the tumors are actually smaller. And so this is what we're learning now, that when patients are immunotherapy, we don't necessarily stop at the first 
evidence of some increase. If they're feeling well and doing well with minimal side effects, we continue them a little bit longer and see around three or four months if there's actually some uh, shrinkage or late effect. Um, I've got a few slides here showing some of the new immunotherapy studies that we are conducting at Western Regional. Uh, these are unique to our cancer center, and um, because of the way we do clinical trials and have our funding structure, we're able to self-fund these studies so we don't rely necessarily on pharmaceutical companies uh, to conduct these types of trials as long as the drugs are commercially available. So we have some studies designed for patients with HER2-positive breast cancer, gastric cancer. Uh, we also have studies for patients with colon cancer. And uh, these are combining a PD-1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab, along with standard of care treatments, uh, shown here. And we're uh, continuing to accrue patients on that. We have another multi-arm study with uh, standard chemotherapy that's used in advanced cancer. And these are uh, for patients with sarcoma, uh, triple negative breast cancer, uh, which we've now gone into phase two. We have arms for pancreas cancer as well as small cell lung cancer. And we've just recently opened a, a study for patients with uh, non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma for, that are in relapse using uh, chemotherapy based on some very promising data that was published in New England Journal of Medicine for a PD-1 inhibitor. So we have that along with chemotherapy for those tumor types. And lastly, we have another um, a study for renal cell carcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer, pancreas cancer, and another type of colorectal cancer. Um, so one of the things that we tend to see with just uh, single agent immunotherapy are a bunch of uh, unusual side effects that you may not see with targeted therapy or standard chemotherapy. And these are the result of the immune system being overstimulated. So you can think of autoimmune diseases or, or you know, people having low functioning thyroids. These are the, uh, some of the more common side effects that we might see with immunotherapy, but it can affect a whole uh, host of organs um, as depicted in this slide. And um, basically when we're talking about using monoclonal immunotherapy, anything that ends in itis is a possibility as a side effect, so we have to be very diligent and cautious when we're treating these patients, especially on our earlier clinical trials where there's no information yet on combining them with other uh, antibodies and chemotherapies. So these are some examples of uh, how patients in our clinic have done on immunotherapy studies, not necessarily the ones that I showed you that we have open now. Uh, this is a patient who had been on five prior lines of therapy. So typically, a patient with uh, advanced stage four lung cancer has about two to three lines of therapy, if, as long as they're in good shape, before they uh, either are recommended for hospice or they uh, have to enroll in a clinical trial because we don't have anything else that is standard of care. Uh, this patient had been on another clinical trial and was on uh, that study for about eight weeks before progressing. She then went on this study, which involves immunotherapy, and you can see that there was, uh, this is the, sorry, this is the before. So her tumor was here and here, complete disappearance of this tumor, and this tumor here is smaller. I just saw her uh, this week, and uh, she's continuing to do well without any side effects, and the tumors are even smaller than the ones I'm showing you in these scans up there. Uh, this is another patient that uh, came to us who was on uh, at least one other prior clinical trial with me, and um, he's got KRAS mutant lung cancer for which we don't have any effective targeted therapy, and he's had prior radiation, eventually progressed after several more lines of treatment, and his baseline scans are down here. He had a large tumor here on the left side of the lung with um, almost complete disappearance of that tumor by four months. After just a few doses, so at his first four-week uh, assessment, he lives in elevation, and he was complaining about uh, some fatigue with exertion that completely resolved by the fourth-week visit, and he's doing well without any side effects on this treatment, uh, in contrast to what we might typically see with some target therapy or standard chemotherapy drugs. Um, this is, these are some examples of some of our patients on our combination studies that we're doing at our hospital. This is a patient with small cell lung cancer uh, before and after three cycles, um, almost uh, more than a 50% decrease in the size of their tumors. And the design of our studies is not just to look for tumor shrinkage, but if we're able to achieve, uh, achieve complete radiographic remission or complete response. So we're not, uh, we're not looking for just shrinkage, we're looking for the uh, tumors to completely disappear on the scans. That would be considered a success for the way we're designing our studies. And this is another patient with small cell lung cancer, tumor here with the measurements, and after just uh, three cycles or nine weeks, uh, more than a 50% decrease again. 
Some other things that are being, that are in development with immunotherapy is uh, pharmaceutical companies are trying to identify markers uh, to, or biomarkers to be able to use and identify patients more likely to benefit from these treatments. So they're staining the most obvious target would be PD-L1 if we're looking at a PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor. And uh, there, there's a potential host of problems with some of this uh, protein staining is there can be heterogeneity, and we don't quite yet know what is the best um, aspect of the tumor to look at. Is it the leading edge where immune systems may be involved in, or is it the central part of the tumor? And um, there are a variety of antibodies that are out there that are in development. Some of them are very specific for, the, for this target, and some are less specific. So that could be a, an issue down the road. And um, so I just focused right now on PD-1 and PD-L1, but there are a number of other immune-based targets. Most of them are working on the T cells, and they're outlined here in the slide. Um, so there, there's more to come in the field of immunotherapy for patients with advanced cancer. Um, other types of treatments that you may have heard of, if you're watching 60 Minutes or you watch the PBS special on the uh, Emperor of All Maladies, so uh, there is CART therapy, which is chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. And briefly, I'll just describe what that is so you have an understanding. Uh, we're now, um, people that are working in the CART therapy field, we're now in the third generation. And basically what they do is they take the T cells out of a patient, uh, they make some modifications, add some additional uh, receptors to the T cells, and then reinfuse that back into the patient. Um, what is really exciting about that therapy is that you can see long, durable responses in some people, complete remission. Um, the challenges are the cost, the time to develop these individualized therapies. They can take several weeks, and a patient may not have that much time to be off therapy before they need this treatment. Some other things uh, is that some patients may have had uh, or may have or experience uh, potential life-threatening um, complications because of severe or significant overstimulation of the immune system when they get these cells reinfused. And most of the data and, and most of this promising stuff has been seen right now in lymphomas and leukemias, which, uh, in my opinion, tend to fall more in that stupid ca uh, cancer category than the smart cancer category. Uh, we're really waiting to see if this is going to work in patients with the, with the more complicated, advanced solid tumors. Another type of immunotherapy that's out there that um, you may come across by uh, watching some of the news programs or reading uh, the newspaper um, are genetically engineered viruses or oncolytic viruses. And basically, this takes a virus, uh, cuts some of the protein out, makes it, uh, uh, while it, it can infect other cells, it does not cause uh, pathogenic infections of that virus. So there's been a special where they talked about poliovirus being readapted. And uh, with that, they then put some um, uh, tar special targets in there where it will hone and, and uh, um, target the cancer cells when they're reinfused or injected into the patient. The same type of potential uh, is with the genetic engineered viruses. We can see the long, durable remissions for certain individuals. Um, these treatments are less specific than CART therapy because they're not taking the patient's individual T cells. These are um, viruses that are constructed in the lab and then infused to patients that are participating on those studies. Again, you can see severe life-threatening reactions, and um, there have been a, a host of large studies thus far with oncolytic viruses, and many of them have actually had fairly disappointing results. So we're hopeful that uh, someone's going to figure this out, and maybe this will be a treatment for the future as well. So I want to leave you with uh, some conclusions, and as I summarize my talk, we have to match the right target, the drug, and the tumor type to make a critical impact in cancer care, especially for people with stage four disease. And most of the promise that we've seen thus far are in the quote unquote stupid cancers. The CTLA and PD-1 immunotherapy that I've shown you some slides on are now in the clinic for melanoma and a certain type of lung cancer called squamous cell lung cancer. And these um, are likely going to be approved in the near future for a host of other cancer types and will likely be one of the backbones of treatment going forward. In general, the immunotherapy that, uh, that are uh, antibodies are better tolerated than some of the earlier generations of immunotherapy like IL-2 with a similar or possibly longer term duration of durable response or disease control. Um, the CART therapy and the oncolytic viruses are still in clinical development, um, but I am 
concern that they may not be broadly applicable to other cancer types and they may just have their mainstay in the liquid tumors or leukemias and lymphomas, but that remains to be seen. And lastly, the next steps are to improve our selections for identifying the patients uh, to get the most benefit, and it's most likely going to be with combinations, whether that's target therapy and immunotherapy or targeted or combinations of multiple immunotherapies or CART therapy and something else uh, that still remains to be seen. And we're looking for the, the highest level of responses, hopefully durable, complete responses, and achieving this with uh, minimal toxicity. And, uh, that is the end of my talk, and I thank you.